so um hi first of all i want to say how grateful i am for the audience that is uh listening to us online and is uh watching this uh, in recording because it's amazing how people are joining educational so, events so i'm say, uh, thankful to everybody who is here who is who is watching us online or in recording um i think that in the future we're going to uh, defeat this challenging time and uh, we are a force to be reckoned with so first let me give a shout out to propium the School of Project Management for the construction industry that's organizing this event. These guys train managers and specialists in construction um, and they elevate their qualification in project management during peaceful times and during wartime, they're making these amazing events on uh, post-war reconstruction. And how cool is that? I'm your moderator today. My name is Katerina Kozlova. I'm stoked to be here. I'm an architectural writer and a mentor from Ukraine. I help architects to navigate their career. And I also done some interviews on post-war reconstruction for Bird and Flight magazine, but today is not about me. We've got uh, an hour and around an hour of awesome content um, with a very important guest. I'll be moderating this dialogue, so get ready to learn some new things and hopefully have some fun, although not a fun topic we have today. So let's give a warm welcome on my side, at least uh, to our amazing speaker. We're so grateful for his support and participation in this meeting and in Ukraine in general. So he is Dr. Keith Miyamoto. He's the CEO of Miyamoto International and the president of Miyamoto Relief Fund. And he's all about making the world a better place. And uh, get this, so he started with just five people in Sacramento, California, and now he's got 25 locations around the world, and that's a serious growth. Uh, Dr. Miyamoto is a total expert in disaster resilience, the engineering, disaster response and reconstruction, and he's consulted on projects all over the world. So something really bad happens somewhere, and that's basically where he's buying the first ticket to. But here's the thing that really impressed me while I studied his um, his 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 um, doings. He built a business model on investing in the local economy and created a new branch of his company in a place of total instability and staying there for years to come. And somehow that works, you know. So today we're talking about kids' company work in Turkey and Ukraine and all over the world also. So Dr. Miyamoto, uh, have I forgotten to mention anything about yourself that you want to add, maybe? No, no thank you, you covered all. Thanks so much, Katrina, for kind words. I really appreciate that. Yeah, so let's start the interview then. So you are a structural engineer interested in seismic safety. How did you get involved in humanitarian work? Well, as you said, you know, we start as the, the very small company, five people in Sacramento, California, a small town. And uh, that company was doing uh, engineering for like a schools and stuff like that, small commercial buildings. And uh, that's company actually I took over. It used to be named uh, Marsh and Associates, and I was working for them, you know. And um, but we, doing a, we were doing a very interesting things. We put like a seismic energy dissipators in the building system so you can absorb the energy and all kinds of stuff, which no one was doing at the time. And uh, especially like older buildings and stuff like that. And we say, you know what? We got to do just a little bit more than doing an engine in California. We just being a global. So we changed the name to Miyamoto International. And the people thought I was crazy because we have no international projects or clients or nothing, you know. I guess I'm kind of international. That's about it, really. So soon after, we opened office in LA, Orange County, San Diego, San Francisco throughout because the, the, we approached very differently. We approached in a more like a sense of the uh, resiliency or long-term vision of how this, you know, built environment impact this, you know, community we're working on. Then uh, uh, we started working, started working with the World Bank and people like that. And soon after, you know, there was a, a earthquake in Haiti, 2010, which destroyed about 250,000 buildings and it killed about 315,000 
people. That's a, essentially dead list earthquake, natural, you know, disaster happened to the human or humankind's fall. I mean, maybe forever. So there, uh, you know, we're the only one really engine company, not only show up, but we many people show up, but also we stayed, we become localized. We formed a company called Miyamoto Haiti. Uh, Guilherme Victor, she's a Haitian national. She's a manager of a company. And also the all the engineers are Haitians too. So we built the capacity within the Haitian community and uh, essentially localized this thing, you know. So it's a private business. So therefore, the, the, we don't have to solely rely on the uh, donations or funding. You know what I mean? So around 2015 or so, the funding uh, run now from Haiti. There's not much, you know, international money coming through. But Miyamoto Haiti is always there because uh, working for Haitian private sector or government and so on. So to this day, we just exist. And we actually, at the 2021, there's a large earthquake again. And uh, we expand really quickly, you know, about 500 people. And they're all Haitians again. And just only one international, that's it. 500 Haitian engineers and one international and reconstruct the whole 180,000, assess, assess about 180,000 buildings and uh, uh, trained probably like 50,000 people out there in the southern parts of Haiti for actually repair components of it, you know. So that's the our kind of business model, just to be on a local level, be localize it, and uh, just become normal engine business after this disasters done. So, so same thing applied to Miyamoto Ukraine. And uh, it's it's uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian led, Ukrainian staffed company. We have almost 60, 70 people now. And uh, it's pretty robust entity actually. So yes, uh, right now we are repairing schools and apartments and houses and stuff like that, you know, because this is a emergency time. But vision is the, the, to become the normal Ukrainian engine company, you know what I mean? After the whole thing's done. So seeing a much longer term uh, investment, that, that's how we look at it. Yeah, sure. Um, but let's start from uh, from the beginning, from your life and work in California. Is California sure. a seismic prone zone? Oh yeah, I mean, at, uh, you know, there was earthquake here in uh, San Francisco, we call Loma Prieta earthquake in uh, 1989 and uh, Northridge earthquake in 1994. And it was a pretty, people thought it was a big event, you know, but there is actually moderate seismic event. And a really big one we had here is 1906 San Francisco. And that was a true urban disaster then. So that's something that, uh, uh, you know, seismologists uh, forecast about 80% uh, or higher probability a big one will hit in uh, either San Francisco, either uh, Southern California or Northern California. It's a large, large scale event we'll see, you know, next uh, from today to next 30 years, essentially. Yeah, so today we're, we'll talk about your work in Turkey after the huge earthquake that struck the sure. region this year. And it's easy, uh, let's say, to push the seismic safety after the earthquake. But the US uh, has this. Uh, looming problem in the future and um, are you and your company and the U.S. in general uh, preparing for this possible earthquake now? Well, I mean, at, uh, look at what happened to Turkey, right? Essentially, Turkey is also preparing in in big deal. I mean, I was involved. I was a part of a, a Istanbul government uh, official uh, embedded into it about, uh, well, around 2008 or nine, and they are very serious about the seismic risk. So even that, look what happened in the southern part of Turkey, right? 50,000 people died and, you know, 30,000 buildings collapsed. It's, uh, it's, but, you know, if you see the whole stock of it, like a schools and hospitals actually perform really well in Turkey because that's where their focus was, but it's missing the, the inspections and stuff like that. So it's really the, it has to be like a whole, whole community thing. Not can be just like a schools or hospitals or police station to be good or airport, but just to have to have apartment buildings and everything else has to be, you know, up to the code essentially. It was not there. I think California will face, face a similar kind of thing, by the way. I mean, at the, especially at the older buildings, Turkey condition was anything built 
prior to about 2000, that's where building code changed. Anything before that is essentially has no seismic consideration at all. So it's very dangerous. California's case is uh, 1973. So anything built prior to that, the mid 1970s, it's really dangerous in the California. In uh, LA alone, where I live, there's something like uh, 6,000 to 7,000, what we call non ductile concrete structures. That's a, all the concrete structures right, built prior to 1973. And um, uh, they're uh, fragile. If the magnitude is 7.8, 7.5, like what we saw in Turkey, same thing happened in, say, LA Basin, you're going to see the thousands of buildings collapse. Just is no question. I mean, they're a fragile state. And um, so LA is actually one of the most progressive cities, by the way. Uh, it passed the uh, ordinance to basically identify and notify the building owners of those type of buildings to do, to do the analysis and the seismic strengthening in the next 20 some years. That's actually really, you know, first step. But to me, 20 years, I think chance of something happened before that time is a very, very high. So something has to be done, done right now, but that's a challenge California faces actually. Uh, and how can we make uh, those old um, dangerous houses um, earthquake resistant? Is there any possibility to do it? Oh yeah, I mean uh, there is a, a technology built over the years and uh, which been implemented in both uh, Japan and California, even Turkey too. You can uh, use the uh, what we call seismic energy dissipators. Essentially, it's a shock absorbing elements in the building you put it in. It kind of like a, your car has a spring, right? And you have a shock absorber. It's basically the same thing. You can provide shock absorber in a building to absorb the energy. And uh, or there's a fiber reinforced uh, plastic. There are actually a very strong plastic which you can wrap around the columns, just make it stronger or ductile we call, uh, base isolation, essentially put the building underneath of a roller kind of, and you can actually build ground moves by building state type of technology exists. So there are a lot of things like that you can do. And they usually cost about somewhere between 5% to 15% of a replacement cost. So if you think about it, it's pretty cost effective, right? You know, 5%, 10%, you can do, a, you know, a, what total replacement cost. You can make a building good as uh, essentially new as far as seismic safety is concerned. But that's the difficult part of it. Because in the usual settings, spending a 5%, 10% in a total building things, you have to add the uh, market value. Market, commercial sense have to make sense, right? So in a California, if someone spend five or 10%, is that would it be, uh, you can charge more for rent. You can charge more for space for the uh, hotels. Probably not because public is not really aware of the so-called benefit of it. Japan, it does, by the way. The, uh, if you take the subway and uh, in Japan, there's advertisement talking about this new apartments for sale it's base isolated and usually about 10 percent 10 percent more expensive but people gladly pay for that and you're going to see that because japan you know we have this earthquake every i mean big earthquake probably every five years you know so public are keenly aware of it you know what i mean california last one moderate earthquake was you're talking about 1994 you're talking about 30 some years ago almost right so it doesn't have that kind of a public awareness. So if there's no public and supportive, just market doesn't react to it. So it makes it extremely difficult to, to do seismic strengthening, you know, program like that, you know, unless being forced to do. So you go to Turkey, you will see, you will see the, uh, actually I, I get a lot of calls now to look into that their old factories, old apartments to take a look because there is a market, there's a population demand, public demand to do things like that in the private sector. Because the government just cannot enact a law, just say everybody has to decide to strengthen them. It doesn't work that way. Every government there see that how public, how they support this, whatever that, you know, enactment do, right? So that's why that, that kind of thing is important. 
Uh, yeah, sure. And uh, do you have any advice for individuals or communities who want to be better prepared for an earthquake or an other similar natural disaster? Sure, most definitely. I think that that's probably the most important part of it. Now, even a Turkey bad as what it is, you're talking about 35,000 buildings collapse, right? And uh, you're talking about total building stock affected is about 1.7 million building stock. So you're talking about 2% buildings collapsed. 2%, okay? And uh, uh, about 100,000 more got severely damaged. And on top of it, about 500,000 more light damaged. So essentially, the 70% uh, of building stock, or well, 50% of building stock has no damage at all. And about 30% more is actually light, lightly light damage. So you're talking about 60, 70, 70% of building stocks is okay, you know. So what people should do though, I think the, uh, we should really prepare for it because we have to have like say, uh, make sure communication, make sure that how, you know, family member will be located, located place, that kind of things are important. Have a two weeks of a supply of food and water, stuff like that. So it does not impact too much to the uh, really needs there. So that kind of community effort. And uh, also the uh, uh, most of rescue happens first 30 minutes, first hour. That's done by community, by the neighbors. You know, that's actually the most effective way to doing that. So that type of kind of community engagement, how to do it. I think that kind of thing is really critical. But uh, and also the uh, like a government side. It's a key key role take, you know. Many criticize media, especially media, criticize the, the how ineffective was the Turkish government, you know, for this response. It was completely untrue, by the way. I don't know exactly how those news come from. I mean, I know that all those places I go, and uh, this government actually did it well. I mean, essentially, they deployed almost hundred fifty thousand warm tents, hundred fifty thousand, and the first like essentially like a 24 hours to 48 hours. And uh, they managed to have the uh, 10,000 urban search and rescue team, foreign teams coming through, 10,000 members, located in a strategic location really fast. And also they had almost like 200,000 emergency staff members on the ground personals, okay, to coordinate you know, all that stuff. And by the other day two I was there, um, they started doing it. They got heavy equipment everywhere to essentially remove and debris from our stuff and fixing the roads and stuff like that. So by by day three, every freeway, every highway was completely open. Anywhere you can go anywhere with a speed limit. And uh, uh, Hatay that's heavily da uh, damaged. That airport was damaged, but open in after four days. You know. And uh, they assessed uh, almost like a 300,000 buildings in the first two weeks. And they categorized that. They put a QR code for each of this. That's like a fastest damage assessment I have ever seen, you know? So as far as the, the initial weeks, initial month, I think a Turkish government, the way they react to do something, I have never seen anything like that. It's, it's just probably one of the best practices. And that's, I think a lot to do with the uh, Turkey, as I said, Turkey, has been preparing for this. They're, they've been preparing for the Istanbul earthquake, the city of 20 some million people. So they are prepared for that. I think that's a lot to do with it, you know? So that kind of thing is really important. Yeah, but I saw that if we're going already uh, to talk to Turkey, which we were going to anyway, uh, I saw that uh, Turkish government and Turkish officials were criticized not for the relief effort, in the first hours of the earthquake, but for the lack of monitoring of how um, new constructions are being made. So the new constructions were damaged because like anyway, um, anyone can be a contractor in Turkey and so on. So so lack of regulation, mm -hmm. it's, it's the main problem. Uh, do you agree? Oh yeah, exactly. It's not about, I mean, response, but structure, I just said they did a good, great job. Actually, I say A. And but as far as the, the what's lacking there is not a building code. Turkish has a, a build, uh, seismic building code similar to what we have in California. And uh, education system is great. Engineering is fantastic. 
It's just that what's lacking is implementation of it. So once it comes to private owned buildings, there's no requirement for uh, inspection by the engineers. So contracts can can build and there's no requirement for license system, the contractors. So anyone can be contracted to build things there. And those are small buildings are big buildings, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twelve 12 story buildings. You know, th those are how people live, even smaller towns, kind of like Ukraine, you know, similar kind of setups. And um, but there's no license system and no inspection system that's killed at 50 some thousand people, you know. And so but once look the uh, public buildings and that required to have like inspection, right? Done right. They performed very well. Actually, the uh, there's about a dozen new hospitals in affected area, which has a base isolation. You know, as talked about, base isolation is put the kind of roller underneath the building, right? All of them. They not only did not get damaged, but they're actually functional after this magnitude 7.8 and 7.5. That's pretty actually amazing, actually. So yes. Turkish engineering is good if if that's done right. It's like actually functional after this incredible event and all the free all the highway. Uh, there's a lot of viaduct the bridges perform just good too. You know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm telling you after after four days, you can drive through those highways in 100, 110 kilometer per an hour. It's not a problem, you know, so that's what matters, you know, have the you know, engineering need to be done right. And uh, implementation inspection is really critical. And using the high tech devices those are available to make it, things even better than what, what it is. So those things that uh, they done right for public infrastructure, but private sec private buildings, no, there was no regulation was not there. I'm positive that would change there though, really rapidly out there for sure. Uh, if you're saying that uh, Turkish engineering is so good, why do they need uh, Miyamoto International there? <laughs> good question. No, they don't need us. Trust me. I mean, uh, they don't. I mean, at the, every country I go, you know, there's a great engineers. No question about it. If you see top 10% of engineers, they are educated in many different international places from US and Japan to you, you name it. And also Turkish Institute is just great universities. I mean, many of our professors in the California teach earthquake engineers do come from Tur Turkey, right? But I think that uh, what international, so Turkey can do a lot, but what's international can do, and there's a room for it. You don't need a many international flying back and forth though. Because internationals, we bring in the two things. One is the um, uh, experience of a massive disaster reconstruction type of things, especially the, uh, the experience from not only successes, but failures, you know? Failures about what works, what does, you know, what didn't work and stuff like that. That's actually the, the really important aspect. Second is the uh, uh, internationals. We, we can, can't, I don't say we, we break the rules, but we can talk to segments of societies. For example, engineers and architects may not be able to reach the government or UN agencies, but we can do that because just being a foreigner, you know, it's that's it's kind of true, and uh, because we don't know any better, I guess. So we kind of kind we can kind of break the barrier almost. So that's how we function in like in Haiti uh, was was like that, you know, it was small island state. But there's like the uh, UN agencies, there's a US Army, there's a big presence in 2010, and uh, there's a Haitian mass, there's a Haitian private sector. They don't even talk to each other because the Haitian government, because they're completely different things going on. But as engineers, as international engineers, we can connect with those dots. So we're able to connect the dots, essentially. And uh, also the Miyamoto, we have the uh, long-term agreement with the United Nations or uh, US government. So we, have a, we can get the funded. We, we, we can we can bring in the money per se, you know, to the local levels. So that's actually pretty big. And uh, because those contractual mechanisms are extremely difficult and, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy to deal with, but we know how to do that kind of things like that. So combination of a really the kind of a international experience of a, um, failures and the successes, those are both important, right? So we don't have to repeat again. And also that uh, funding and also that uh, kind of get into it. But it's really important to lead by the uh, 
national teams, though. You know, that's local teams, the most critical one. I think too many organizations like us show up and put international in a full-time charge on the ground, it doesn't work at all. Has to be the uh, national decisions, you know, has to be led. I think that's the most important aspect of it. I think that's something that we do very differently from other other agencies. I, I noticed that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so after a major earthquake like this in Turkey, what are the most important steps that need to be taken to ensure safety and minimize damage now and in the future? Most important thing is to the, the let public know what really happened to their assets, you know, because uh, as I say, there's 1.7 million buildings, right? Out of about 500,000 buildings are lightly damaged, which means you see cracks in a finished plaster or uh, walls and stuff like that. And then people don't know what does that mean, obviously, you know? So most important thing is to assess those assets correctly and uh, quantify how to fix them. And uh, give the knowledge to how to fix those lightly damaged or moderate damaged one. I think that's a really, really important one. Because uh, government usually focus, which they are in Turkey too, focus on the uh, uh, collapse, collapse assets. You're talking about 30,000 buildings collapse and probably up to maybe 50 to 70,000 more need to be taken down. So you're talking about 50,000 buildings probably have to come down, the big buildings. You know, cost per million to million and a half to doing things like that. That itself, like a fifty billion dollars to do, right? So they're focused on that. Meantime, the uh, um, lot of lightly damaged construction that needs to be addressed, and that need that left to this people to do that. So that aspect of it, just access through those things and uh, start um, uh, repairing those things. Those are actually really critical elements there. Thank you, and. Uh... What is your company doing in Turkey right now? Uh, is it already, uh, is it still relief or you're already rebuilding something? Well, again, let's talk about Turkish government, right? Those people are incredible. They started demolition the building on day three and they actually start the rebuilding it. They actually build new apartments right now in the most, most affected area. So those are heavily damaged ones. So we basically at uh, assisting the place where Yap is, like a light, light damage you know, components, which can be repaired really quickly. You're talking about maybe two weeks, three weeks. And uh, you can make a safe house or safe apartments so, so, so people can come back really quickly. But at the same time, yet it's important people to understand that potential vulnerabilities still exist. You know, so we at the same time, yet we're doing a vulnerability assessment and uh, communicate with the people. What does this mean? Really? You know, I think that's a really uh, important to be transparent. So that's what we're doing. So we have a, we set up the uh, local company called Miyamoto Protect. That's a local managed company again. And uh, uh, so we, we've been doing it. But again, we've been in Turkey for quite a long time, though. We have a uh, member of Turkey in Istanbul since uh, almost 2009. So we, we understand the context of that uh, you know, Turkish society is really well. So we've been there. Mm -hmm. It's a great country, you know. I know, I know. I, I love Turkey. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you there were uh, can you comment on the theories in media that I've read that um, war in Ukraine, uh, this uh, constant blast that we have, provoked the earthquake in Turkey? Is this possible? It's not possible at all. No, not those, possible at all. Those bombs from uh, Russia's is weak. Yeah, gonna nah. It doesn't mm -hmm. break. It doesn't break the earth. It doesn't break the Ukrainian. That's one thing I know. Okay. Uh, They're trying. I can see, as I can see, not a possible. Yeah, they they'd love that. Um, since uh, <laughs> since autumn, you are here in Ukraine, um, and your company is here in Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, is it the first time your company is involved in repairing war damage? No, actually, the uh, um, uh, Syria and different places. Uh, in uh, Afghanistan, in a place like that, you know, we we get involved, but this is definitely at the big scale, you know, of it. It's it's a it's a largest. Well, it's not even post conflict. It's a uh, you know active conflict going on. So yeah, no, this is uh, something uh, pretty unique, I must say. How how is it different from seismic 
prone, uh, like pre um, making buildings mm. uh, earthquake prone and uh, rebuilding after earthquake. How is it different from mm. war damage and this situation? Well, there's like good and bad news about this thing. So the you know war area, which is essentially the, the east east of Ukraine and the Kiev area, you know north and that, and that area is on seismic prone. Seismic area in Ukraine is uh, you're talking about south, you know, south and east. I mean, uh, west and south corner. That's seismically active, actually, close to Romania and stuff like that, you know, and uh, Crimea. Yes, that to that whole area. But uh, fortunately, up north, it was not. So, well, there's a uh, bad news too, is if it's not if we're good, if the building design per seismic code per se, you don't see that progressive collapse you see out there. Because when you design for seismic, essentially you tight building together well. So if that one area come down, even one columns come down, everything doesn't collapse. But you see the problem is sometimes the one hit happens, you know, whole things kind of fall off like that. That's the because there's no seismic details. That's because there's no seismic area. That's bad news, right? Good news is the um, uh, you know, sometimes I see the, the holes created by, say, tank artificially, you know, just holes in apartments. You can fix that, actually, you know, and uh, it's 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 not, I don't say easy, but it's, it's actually pretty rapidly you can actually fix those things. And if the seismic area, it takes a little more effort to do things. Like, and the seismic damage is more difficult, by the way, because they'll spread out throughout the whole building system. And also aftershocks going on uh, continually, right? So it's a definitely that uh, seismic damage is much more difficult than at the create by the, the one hole uh, caused by the Russian tanks. Those can be fixed actually much faster, much safer. You know what I mean? So it's kind yeah. of bad and good news about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I also I I am an architect by my education, and I know <clears throat> that in Ukraine um, we love to make constructions very very hard and thick like our uh, concrete and our um all our constructions are like with a lot of um you know just just encasing there a lot of concrete uh do you agree with this and does it help us our new buildings at least stay uh after the war damage during i mean yeah, I mean, Ukraine, you know, Ukraine is like the technically first country, right? I mean, it is like advanced engineering and architecture, just just no question. I mean, you guys got the biggest nuclear plants in the whole world after all. And, um, you know, very advanced place. And um, I think I, I think the way, way, way you build is very same, same as anyone else build. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, especially new construction, it's a very good architecture, you know, very good way to build things. It kind of matches the how lifestyle and the culture of the Ukrainian people, how they will live, you know. And um, I don't think there's no changes, but maybe one thing that uh, technically speaking, if you're going to be more like a resilient against the uh, blast or or earthquake, having uh, earthquake detailing in the structural systems, which doesn't take that much, by the way, it's just that how the rebars are engaged or ties around it just a little bit more, you know, probably should not add any cost at all, maybe like a half percent or one percent to the construction cost, maybe to make it seismically resilient or bomb resilient. You can make the you can make the structures to be blast resilient and uh, prevent a collapse progressive collapse essentially you can do things like that so some of the uh, important structures especially the uh, you know there's a lot of uh, uh bases being you know uh damaged and uh reconstruct a uh, reconstruction of uh, uh that type of critical infrastructures should should have the uh earthquake seismic de detailings in there that makes a huge difference on the survivability of that uh asset you know, in case of any kind of a further attacks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell a little bit how is your help organized in Ukraine and what does it include? So uh, again, that uh, uh, we have a country manager, Pablo, and who's who actually, you know, obviously come from, actually he from Kharkiv originally. 
and he's living in uh, Kiev for quite a long time, and um, he's 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 leading the whole effort. And uh, we have about 60, 70 uh, mainly engineers, and um, also we have a communication specialist, Misha. And uh, so it's a whole company set up. We have a uh, Miyamoto uh, Ukraine is uh, just local local company, you know, Ukrainian company, and uh, we are working with the. Uh, uh, UN agencies such as UNOPS and um, uh, IOM and uh, uh, US embassies and uh, uh, Japanese embassy. So, and ECHO, you know, those are funded by those organizations. And uh, we look uh, actually at uh, assessing, repairing about combination of probably about 7,000 units of the uh, houses and apartments and about 100 schools right now. And this is mainly for lightly damaged uh, assets to do an assessment and a repair. But the next step should be scaled up to, uh, especially you have a structural damage one. I think that's need to be really uh, addressed. And that would be that the, to, to us is something really critical, just to repair as fast as possible. And as you see, you know, people coming back. I mean, that's something about Ukrainian. You know, you guys are extremely, resilient you're you're like a quietly resilient kind of people it's pretty interesting you know and you're determined to live you know that's just unbelievable to me i'm talking about you know just women and kids coming back to to all the way to harkeep and you know, everywhere you know just the that's back to that normal fast as possible so yes we, you know many argued why are you fixing now still wars going on well because people are coming back you got to fix them I think that's a really important. It cannot stop. Cannot wait for the so-called final, you know, uh, things happens, which obviously victory. But the, you know, before the victory, we just got this. You got to start really living. People start living, so we got to start fixing. You know, so that's the whole whole concept here. So, yeah, we uh, um, uh, come up to just only lightly damaged, moderate, heavy, heavily damaged. I think that type of things. Just start. Let's fix it. And also the. Uh, um, there's some certain risks exist though. Um, there's the, uh, um, you know, uh, Ukraine just recently banned the uh, uh, dangerous building materials such, such as the uh, asbestos, you know, which you're keenly aware of. And so there's a lot of those things, and especially the uh, older apartments, which being uh, destroyed, but still standing. You see a lot of them, thousands of them, you know, they contain that kind of a material. So, has to have a technical demolition of those things. That's something we're sort of working with the local institute to see that what we can do about it, you know? Yeah, what are the biggest challenges you have here already, you face here already? I think the biggest challenge is the, uh, I think Ukrainian uh, system of the construction, you know, especially like approval process and stuff like that, it's it's fairly cumbersome. <laughs> and, uh, it's 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 definitely not designed for this type of emergency repair and uh, reconstruction stuff like that. So that component, to me, that, that's probably the most challenging part of it. How to over overcome that legally to do right? You know, you got to do it legal, obviously, but how to just but same time have to go move fast, right? So that's the the really challenges challenges there. But I think we are o overcoming it. Um. Yeah. Can you discuss any specific projects that? you already made, repaired, or fixed? Yeah, I mean, uh, initially, the uh, uh, we started to talking to people and assessing, like this last year, right? And um, to see what kind of program should set up, especially in the Kiev uh, area, you know, outside of Kiev, and uh, uh, occupied area, and kind of see the, how we can do things. And um, after we start talking to, those uh, homeowners, you know, babuskas, you know, in uh, the little houses in village, and and we start building this expectation that we, you know, you are gonna come back really fast and do that. But I know the fact it takes a while to kind of gear it up and coming back do that. It, it takes a while, you know. Uh, there's a procure you, you won't have to afford a procurement places, you know, stuff like that. So we just didn't want to kind of show up and assess things and nothing happened. That's like a horrible thing. So we have a, a nonprofit called Miyamoto Global Disaster Relief, 
And we actually made up and also here in Ukraine also, yeah, Miyamoto Relief Ukraine. And uh, we are raising funds from all over the places. And we actually addressed it at uh, one school, uh, kindergarten, fixed some certain roof and stuff like that. And then some of the houses and apartments, we actually start, we actually complete already. So it's a very small scale, but I think start off something is really, really critical, you know? And once you talk to people, you just cannot kind of leave there. You just have to do it, you know? And right now, the, um, um, we are raising money on a school in Kiev, which is being well damaged. It's, um, how do I describe it? The school number 160, I think it's called 160. And um, it's, it's a small order school. It's a pretty sizable, several hundred kids in there. They go there every day, you know. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. And um, even uh, just just amazing. And it's been damaged pretty heavily. The roof got a whole bunch of holes, obviously, and the window is gone. And the government did replace the window, but there's still uh, roofing leaks going on and some chemistry room is broken. And the, the basement of a bomb shelter they use, but only have like a one bathroom, you know, so several could be like, you know, 400 kids could go there to, you know, just have a one bathroom is not reasonable. So we uh, raised the money right now to re rebuild or repair this particular school, School 160 in Kiev. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, so your company came here, you came here because of the wish to help Ukraine, as far as I understood. And you came both with your commercial company and with your fund. But you are investing with your business in a country that could have this war for many, many years to come. And you don't know that we will soon have this prosperous period of rebuilding and ordering engineering from you. So how do you manage the risk? You will. Ukrainian will. <laughs> you guys prevail. No, it's not gonna be years. Oh yeah, no question. <laughs> okay, you know. thank you. Yeah. So, so your risk management is, is just um, um, fake it until you make it, right? Well, I don't know about faking it. It's just the, uh, I mean, you know, yeah, we're gonna be just repairing and that kind of things we're doing right now. But no, I think I just have no, no, no doubt in my mind. I mean, that the way you guys coming back, you you live, or you're gonna invest in. I mean, it's gonna be, you know, yes, it's gonna be. Commercial investment is going to take some time because of the, you know, private investment is much more conservative than the public one, right? They, they can take much risk. So it will take some time to have an actual investment happening like that. But I wouldn't be surprised start happening things like that by end of this year, though, you know. And um, it's, I think, uh, it's it, 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 it will work out for Ukraine, you know. But still, there's going to be quite a bit of a public investment will be happening. There will be a lot of money from the EU and then Japan and United States. You know, uh, I think uh, they are definitely lining up to support this country. Just no question about it. Not only from the government, but people. You know, I mean, we're going to do fundraising here in LA and Kiev. Actually, this coming October, we it's fundraising called ninety one thousand drawings, and uh, essentially collected drawings you know, from all over that from both California and you know Ukraine. And uh, people buy it, and uh, that money 100% goes to this. What well, we're raising for this school in the Kiev I was talking about. And uh, when we talk about things like that, you know, in LA, people are so excited about it. You know, I mean, we done a fundraising for many different causes in the past, but this is something that people get really, really emotionally attached to do things. So, so you have the full support from all over the world. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's nice to hear. We're, it shall prevail, yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask this technical question that we have a really big problem with public, uh, with panel housing from uh, Soviet times, which if a bomb or just a rocket yeah. goes there, it just falls out from the top to yeah. bottom. Yeah, exactly. Can, and we have thousands of those buildings. Can we do something other than dismantling them? Can we somehow make them safe from just falling down from small impact. Yeah, this I was talking about. So if if 
that area is a seismic prone area, they will build, they would have built differently, has more integrity in the system. So it doesn't have a progressive collapse like what you just described. But uh, yeah, you can do the, the concrete tie beams and stuff like that to make it a little more integrate system. So like externally, you can provide the ties and so on. So there are many things you can do actually to make the kind of a progressive collapse to be less and you know, less. You, know, you can do things like that. Fairly cost cost. It's just like almost similar to seismic strengthening program, actually. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah. Are there any? Also wanted to ask you about technical things more. Are there any innovations in your field that you are eager to try? There are being developed right now. In a in a Ukraine, in a context um, of a reconstruction or. Seismic. Anywhere in seismic and reconstruction, some some something that you're eager to try that is being developed and you haven't yet. Maybe some. I don't know. Well, I think the uh, there's a whole like as I talked about, right? Seismic energy dissipators and isolations to the the fiber reinforced plastic, and there and also there's actually that the, even at the fiber reinforced plaza system, you can apply that to make it much more seismically. That's actually a pretty new one. Those things are available. And um, those things have never been widely used, especially the plaster system and stuff like that. And that would be actually good for the uh, Ukraine too, though, because uh, if you want to make the buildings much more blast resilient, you know, having that type of kind of seismic technology a little bit in it, I think that makes uh, much buildings much more safer, you know, actually. Is it possible to use or is it to oh, yeah. now. No, 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 it's not. It's not that expensive. As I said, you know, doesn't seismic detail is additional thing, cost one, one percent, two percent more to do things like that. Uh, you're saying that uh, most part of Ukraine is not uh, seismic prone. It's not seismic Correct. in seismic zone, yeah. But can this change somehow? And is there anything that climate change is doing that uh, makes these seismic risks bigger throughout the world? Well, um, climate change doesn't quite impact, but uh, some do argue though that water levels higher is adding more pressure to the certain you know fault zones. You know, stuff like that. Some do argue about that. Some do argue the Sichuan earthquake in 2008 caused by the, the, the dam built over the certain area, you know. So there's some certain argument about that. And um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, um, but I think that uh, more important things, though, like um, especially learning from a Turkish, you know, event. Now we're going to have a, you know, we, we are going to have a massive reconstruction start happening in the Ukraine, right? No question. And right now, repair phase, but that re reconstruction will happen in fairly near future. And um, I think build back right, it makes sense. And uh, providing the small amount of a seismic detailings, they don't have to be everything. So certain little things in seismic detailings makes those structures much better, you know, much better for bombing, much better for gas explosion, much better for the, uh, uh, in some cases, even a seismic safe area could impact quite a bit. Distance earthquake, you know, would affect actually, you know, especially like a Kiev, you know, on top of a hills and sometimes have a very soft soil, right? You know, that kind of places actually do impact by the long, long distance event, by the way. So I think got to start looking things like that and the build back better differently a little bit. I think that this it's, it would be nice things to do. You know, it doesn't add a cost that much, add a safety factor, incredible amount. You know what I mean? Like for example, you know, Kathmandu, uh, Nepal earthquake in 2015. Kathmandu is several hundred kilometers away from the at the fold zone, but it's built. Kathmandu city is built on about 400 meters thick of very soft clay. So what's affected about? Go soft clay like a gel, right? That new high-rise buildings moved a lot and damaged a lot of them. They didn't expect that would happen. So you know things like that. And uh, so you should. You think your advice would be 
so that we uh, change the building code in Ukraine to add seismic stability into it. I think at the especially critical structures, I think that's a really good practice to do. I think at uh, especially the uh, military, you know, installation. I think that's that that's probably um, she really should because of that, uh, you know, future something happen. I think it, it's more like a bomb resilient, you know, blast resilient construction, that kind of things. Uh, it's, it, it makes sense to me and a lot larger buildings and, you know, stuff like that. You know what I mean? It could impact by long distance earthquake too. After all, Ukraine does have an earthquake area in the southern and eastern, just no question, you know. And uh, so that's, it's there. So that, if that large scale even happens, it will impact the distance places if they sit on soft soil. So I think that's something that uh, it's probably will not cause that much of uh, issues. I think more it's but you, you don't want to create too many things to slow things down. You know, you want to make sure that the things get built fast, but you know, build back better essentially. Exactly. Uh, do you have any more advice for Ukrainians on the rebuilding process? Maybe. I think the um, um, I think it's definitely the uh, uh, you know hazardous materials are talked about asbestos. You know this this is a great occasion to remove the whole thing and um, it's pretty much everywhere. Though you know every house I go, you know the roof, the old roof tiles made of asbestos. You see at the uh, insulation, you know, with the pipes and stuff like that. It's a lot about this as asbestos in it, and uh, they're they're really dangerous, by the way, and. Uh, it's just being recently banned, you know, just this fall, you know, so in a, in a Ukraine. So that's something that uh, we got to be really kind of careful about that, to how to deal with it. So we did actually create the, the one guideline and um, uh, about it, how to deal with this aspect, aspect in a repair of these houses and schools, how to deal with it, you know. But at the same time, it has to be like, um, practical, you know. So let's say find it uh, as best as like that in, say, California. What we do, we put some bubble plastic everywhere, put the hazmat, you know, gears, you go in, right, to do things like that. It's definitely not a possible to do things like that. You're talking about tens of thousands, hundred thousands, you know, assets being damaged have to be repaired and reconstructed, right? But there's actually small things you can do to reduce risk quite a bit. Such as the proper masking, such as the get the wash in your hands, such as the water down that area before the uh, demolitions, little things like that, or wash the shoes, and uh, before go back to home. I think things like that. It's little things like that. It just uh, doesn't cost anything really. It doesn't slow down anything. But uh, you you cut down the hazard factor, risk factor by probably half just doing that. So things like that, you know. I think that uh, the practical things should be implemented into that. So if anyone wants to see the documents, we're actually working with also the, the local institute, you know, the NKV Institute, Technical Institute, to uh, kind of adapt into it. And it's uh, it's both English and uh, Ukrainian. And we are process tried to build this demolition of the high-rise uh, apartments, you know, how to deal with that type of things. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. I think we are going to the end of the interview now. And I also have some questions from the public, uh, which were asked before the interview. And uh, one of those are from Oksana. And she's asking, do you use any debris from uh, during the reconstruction, which are possible to reuse? Yeah, I mean, concrete debris uh, can be used for like a road fill or the filling materials. You know, you can do that, you know, N not able to use as a recycle, though, as a new concrete and stuff. But you can do like that rebar for sure. You know, still. Yeah, I think that's something definitely that every single piece will be recycled. They're pretty valuable, you know. So, yes. And. Uh... I have also a question about like historical heritage mm. and what is the biggest priority to save historical heritage or make it more like seismic prone and uh, what will you never sacrifice in this process of working with historical heritage? I mean, historical buildings are so critical. It's culture, you know, of the country and the people. Those need to be saved. 
And um, we actually look in uh, some of those assets right now because it's, uh, especially that uh, there's a water leaks going to that, those buildings, you know, I mean, the water leaks do cause the water leaks caused by the, the blast, obviously, you know, the holes in the roof and stuff like that. That would do more damage than the initial one. So I think the, the water tightness things, you know, that's uh, repair those things are really, really, really super critical. Uh, U.S. Embassy has a funding called the uh, uh, U.S. Ambassador for the Cultural Preservation. And that's something that, that we've been working with them for a while for many different countries. So hopefully we can collaborate with them to do something in some of assets in uh, Ukraine. Yeah, um, thank you. Do you have anything more to add uh, in the end of the interview? Uh, no, Katrina, you asked me all the great questions <laughs> so i promised had to say what i have to say but one thing uh you know i'm i'm very uh grateful to be in a part of this ukraine you know, re, you know current state of it to be part of it to be in a part of a fabric of a community to look in the schools and you know all this you know hosp hospitals all that stuff, you know, I mean, at the houses and all that stuff, we actually doing it. And um, I'm so grateful and uh, I'm also e equally, I'm very inspired by you guys, you know, how you live, how you wanna just keep going. You don't give up, you know, keep coming back. You try to live as normal life as much as possible. Kids go to school every day, go to restaurant every day. No matter what, you know, doesn't matter what's victory day or not, it's all this, you know. I think that's a that this quiet defi defiance in a sense, you know, or determination to win, determination to live. That's something I don't see that many in the many different parts of the world. So that's something that um, um, I'm I'm so gladly to be a part of that, and I'm I'm so inspired by you. So that's why I'll I'll be there. Thank you for your beautiful words. Thank you for your help, for your expertise that you bring with you. It's really, really important for us. Um, so again, I want to thank you to ProPM who organized this event, to you who came to us and joined today, and to all the public who will watch this uh, in recording. Uh, so have a nice um, evening or day in your uh, in your time zone and goodbye thank you so much bye thank you